Okay, so welcome to this morning session. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Jeff Streets from UC Irving, who is going to talk about generative future flow. Okay, yeah. So thanks, uh, Mario, for that introduction and thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's really great to give this talk here. Uh, uh, I, I, I love generalized geometry. I love this subject. Everything I ever learned about generalized Ricci flow basically came from learning more about generalized geometry. But most times when I give a talk about it, I have to kind of apologize for it. So, so, but not, not to this crowd, I think. So uh, we'll enjoy it. So yeah, so it's going to be uh, two talks uh, today and tomorrow. And so, so today is kind of generalized Ricci flow in the general setting, so no complex geometry. And then sort of tomorrow is generalized Ricci flow in the, in the complex geometry world. So um, it's kind of more like a more like a survey of a bunch of sort of new progress. Um, so it may go, I don't know, a little fast, but I hope you'll ask questions um, and interrupt me. Um, so, okay, yeah, uh, uh, to start, uh, oh, it stopped working. Oh, okay, yeah. No, I went the wrong direction. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so so to start, I'll sort of uh, go over again what already uh, Vicente gave a, a very nice introduction to. So the sort of theory of of, of the generalized Ricci curvature tensor. Um, but so it's okay to see it twice, I suppose. So, so the, the, the most foundational object in generalized geometry is the, is the generalized tangent bundle. So for me, I'll sort of skip right to exact uh, current algebraids. So I think of uh, the vector bundle E, which is a T plus T star, which comes naturally equipped with these, with these two objects. One is this, uh, I'll only use this symmetric and neutral inner product. So there's this natural pairing between um, elements of T plus T star given by this formula. And then this uh, uh, Courant bracket, which I which I write explicitly here, and then I just jump right to to including this uh, twisting by the closed three form. So so H of course is a, is a closed three form, and uh, I mean the, the specifics of this formula are maybe not exactly so relevant to what I'm going to say, but but in any case, this is the this is the Courant bracket. So this is sort of taking the place of like the smooth structure, uh, some generalization of the smooth structure of a manifold. Um, and uh, yeah, so where does the sort of metric come in? So a generalized metric uh, by definition for me is an orthogonal self-adjoint endomorphism of T plus T star, such that if I sort of lower an index, so to speak, with, uh, with the neutral inner product, I get a, a positive definite inner product on, on T plus T star. Um, and you can unwind the, the linear algebra of this sentence. And what it tells you is that it's equivalent to a pair of a, of a classic Ramanian metric and a two form uh, B. And then, and, then, and then this endomorphism takes this explicit form. So it's sort of this uh, diagonal or off diagonal endomorphism using the metric and its inverse and then conjugated by the B field, by E to the B. Okay, and then again, you can grind all that out and this is what you get. Okay, so, um, yeah, so again, as was discussed yesterday, there's not really a levy chavita connection uh, per se, but there is a nice theory of, of connections and curvature. So a generalized connection uh, is, a, is a first order differential operator from sections of E to sections of E dual tensor E, which satisfies some Leibniz rule with respect to um, uh, uh, some functions and is also compatible with this neutral inner product. Okay. We say, uh, yeah, and, and, and these connections, they come equipped with a natural divergence operator. So I wanna say just a, a little bit about these divergence operators. So the divergence of a connection D acting on a section A is just the, is the trace of the, of the derivative. A. Okay, which is a smooth function. Okay, on the map. Uh, we say the, the connection is compatible with the metric if the metric is parallel. So, so D naturally acts on um, endomorphisms of V as well. And so, so we can ask that G be parallel um, but unfortunately, uh, well, the other thing we would ask for in Ramani geometry is to be a torsion free, um, but you can't really quite do that uh, in this setting. So there's not really an immediate analog of, of the levy chavita connection um, uh, by imposing a torsion free condition, but there are some conditions that I won't get into that you can impose on the torsion. And so if you do this and also fix uh, a divergence operator, um, you get a class of connections. This is I guess due to, to Mario, um, you get a class of connections. So it's still not unique, but you get a unique Ricci tensor. Okay. And so 
but roughly speaking, it takes this form. So, so this generalized Ricci tensor I write here um, can be expressed as an endomorphism of T plus T star in this way, where well, what are these what are these objects? So, so this we have these two uh, bismuth connections that show up. So Nabla plus minus is yes, yeah, sorry, th this D is Levi Chivita has nothing to do with, with this generalized D. Um, so I take the Levi Chivita connection and I add plus or minus one half a G inverse H. So these are the connections with torsion plus or minus H have to be lower in index. And then you're basically taking this uh, sort of Bakri Emery type of Ricci tensor of, of these connections. So, so Ricci plus minus H together with this function F uh, is the classic Ricci minus one fourth H squared and then minus plus one half D star H and then plus the sort of bismuth Hessian of, of F, okay? What do you mean by operator identified with DF? Uh, yeah, I'm being very vague. It's so, just inter inner product uh, of the derivative of a function? Well, so first of all, I have to, I'm not using the most general class of divergence operators. So again, like Vicente sort of mentioned this yesterday, I'm using so-called exact uh, divergence operators. And I'm sort of even going farther than that. And uh, even though they're called exact divergence operators, they're, they're not necessarily the form DF, but for but purposes of what I'm going to say, they are. You're choosing a function um, and using it to build the, the divergence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's because because he's fixing a generalized metric, you have a reference divergence, which yeah. is the remaining divergence, and the yeah. F is it's like is a weight. The, is the, you add it to oh I see. Yeah. And you use it in a pedal. Yeah, basically you yeah you have like a you're thinking of is there a bigger piece of chalk? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, so so normally basically you can identify with a measure and your measure is e to the minus f dbg. And this is sort of the measure inducing the divergence operator. And um, this F coincides with the dilaton. Well, it, yes, there's more on that to come. I mean, I guess, well, at least from, yeah, from my point of view, well, well like in, in Ricci flow, the dilaton is very mysterious. I mean, <laughs> the dilaton is very mysterious in general. And this seems to come up in various ways. I'll actually say something about that. So, um, but yes, of course, yes, it's the dilaton, whatever that means, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, and so, yeah, so, so that's the Ricci tensor. And so, yes, this question came up yesterday about the scalar curvature. And so the scalar curvature, we kind of come at from a sort of different perspective. It sort of seems to maybe come out of left field a little bit. Uh, in, in particular, it's not in any way the trace of the, of the Ricci tensor. So you take a very different perspective to get the scalar curvature. So, so classically, one place the scalar curvature arises is by this Lichnerovich formula for the Dirac operator acting on spinners. And so uh, people working in, uh, well, various subjects in particular, I guess the first place I know of this is Bismuth's, uh, this paper on non kahler index theorem. He identified these connections, which aren't really what we call the Bismuth connection, is Nabla plus minus one third, which is the levi chivita connection plus minus now one sixth G inverse H. So now the torsion is one third H. And again, the, the reasoning for this one third is, is a total mystery to me, but maybe uh, something can tell me well, really where this comes from, I, I would really like to know. Um, but so you can compute the Bachner formula on spinners with this connection, this Nabla plus minus one third. And again, this sort of weighted volume form. So this, this dilaton shows up again. And what you get, so you, you compare these two uh, Laplace type operators, this delta is meant to be the Dirac operator. And then what you get, is uh, one fourth times this quantity. So, so R is the classic scalar curvature. And then you know, one twelfth, this magic number, one twelfth norm H squared. And then these extra terms involving the weight, twice the Laplacian of F minus norm gradient of squared. Napla plus minus on the left hand, that's the one with one half? It, yes, yeah, it's it, yeah. Um, for me, this is a total uh, kind of uh, black box, uh, uh, at least intuition wise, uh, I do not really understand. Um, I'm 100% convinced formula, that this is a relevant, a highly relevant. Uh, this object. Formula, like, <laughs> you, could, you could say that it's the reason why the one third is so important because then it makes because the right of this side independent. Yeah. Uh, plus minus. Oh, you're saying this is the. Oh, oh, this is the only such version that is independent. Yeah. That's okay. This one reason to think. That, okay, that's interesting. Is there some interpretation of, I mean, this is gives some definition of this uh, generalized scalar curvature, but is there some interpretation in terms of generalized connections? Or, or we have to go this way? 
no, no. The interpretation we have is this one, which also came before in the, in the world by Waldron, Six Language, Sibula, and Coimbra. But then uh, Friedrich, Friedrich okay. and Pablo no. Severa have ah, okay. a different yeah, one yeah. using uh, an operator in, in, in half principles. Okay. But so, okay, yeah. So in any case, uh, for, for me now, so, so depending on these three objects, the classic metric, the, the torsion three form and, and F, I'll define this, this generalized scalar curvature to be the, the right-hand side of this formula, okay? So naturally incorporating, in some sense, the, the three key objects of, of generalized geometry. So the classic metric, the, the B field, which is in, sort of buried in H now, and, and the dilaton, okay? All right, so um, if, we, if we believe that that's the scalar curvature, so, and, and we sort of want to uh, you know, follow this path of defining canonical geometries, et cetera, so we might want to do this by a variational point of view, so we can define this uh, Einstein-Hilbert action in generalized geometry. So I call this script F, which depends on these three quantities, G, H, and F, where I just integrate this generalized scalar curvature against the weighted volume, okay? okay. And, then, and then this is what you get. Um, and then further, we can go a little bit further. So, uh, yeah. Hey, what happened with the Laplace term? Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry, right. Yeah, there's an integration by parts that happens here. So yeah, the, the sign has, has changed, right? So, um, so I have plus twice Laplace minus a gradient, but then here I have plus gradient just because of integration against the weight, yeah. Um, and then, right, so, well, again, this is perhaps more coming from the Ricci flow, like Kraman point of view, may, may, maybe this dilaton is really sort of an auxiliary parameter. May, maybe G and H are all I care about. So I can define this quantity lambda depending on only G and H, which is just the infimum of script F over Fs, which have unit volume, unit weighted volume, okay? And this is precisely like, uh, if you forget H, this is precisely the first quantity Kraman writes down in this paper and showing that Ricci flow is a gradient flow, okay? And so a computation shows that uh, a pair G and H is a critical point for lambda, for, for this quantity lambda, if and only if the generalized Ricci tensor vanishes, um, where, uh, where again, you, you unwind that and, and, and this, is the, this is the equation that you get, where F has now reappeared as the function achieving this infimum, okay, which does not need to be constant. And again, the D is the Levchita. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the generalized D will not show up again. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's all less Levchita. Yeah. So, so just understand this. So the function depends on G, H, and F. I mean, this is yeah, fine. But it's then you consider particular points, which are G, H. So yeah. what uh, about this? Is... Yeah, so, um, so yes, yeah, so you define this lambda where, where, where you take an infimum over, over these apps. Uh -huh. So this is like a, a first eigenvalue for a Schrodinger operator. Um, so you can say a particular point of, of lambda, lambda, not e for f. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, and then the little f that appears mm -hmm. is, is the relevant. So, so you can prove that there's a unique f achieving this infimum, and it's <laughs> that f in the formula. But in computing this, to verify this, you use the curly f or you use lambda? To, to determine um, critical points. Uh, yeah, you basically use curly up. Yeah, it's actually do the computation. Okay, yeah, and so so this for me by definition, this this system of equations is what I'll call a generalized Ricci soliton. Okay, and uh, yeah, and of course it's it's of course a generalization of of being Ricci flat, right? So if h is zero, f is zero, it's it's just Ricci flat. Uh, maybe in some special case, f is constant, and maybe we call that generalized Einstein. So that would be like the Ricci tensor with Bismuth connection just vanishes. But really, more generally, the, the right thing is, is, is this definition. It's sort of more proper to include uh, the dilaton for various reasons I'll show. Um, is it reasonable to think of generalized Ricci soliton as an extremal Kähler metric analog? Well, that I'll, uh, why I, for, I forget exactly what I'll say tomorrow, but uh, I, I mean, I won't exactly say anything about that tomorrow, but. Uh, uh, of course, one could put a complex structure or, I mean, one could ask basically for this PDE where the GH is coming from like a pluricolor structure or a generalized Kähler structure. And yeah, of course, I'll have a lot to say about those in general tomorrow, but that's not usually what we would call extremal. 
Well, I mean, extremal in the Kaler world, just, it means something different, right? It's, uh, but of course, yeah, I mean, they're critical points of some functional, so in that sense, extremal. But extremal is, is like a critical point for this, like, Calabi energy. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah. Yeah. Sorry, can, can you repeat what you said about uniqueness in the in the, in the, in the, the the little f which achieves this in thema is unique. Is unique. Yeah. Yeah. Is this true? So so you are supposed that G is Riemannian. Oh uh, yeah 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 is yeah. For me, everything's Riemannian signature. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it important for the result that it's unique? Uh, 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 I'm not sure. Okay. Pro probably no. But I know it's, nothing about hyperbolic PD, so okay, yeah, I, <laughs> it's some kind of hyper, like wave type equation for F or something. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, yeah. So, so I want to say a bit about generalized Ricci soliton. So before I, I still haven't gotten to, to generalized Ricci flow yet. So, so the, the first the first examples we have of these generalized Ricci solitons are just bismuth flat manifolds. So, so if bismuth connection is just flat, then of course, of course, those equations are satisfied. The, the bismuth Ricci tensor will be zero. And so these are classified. And I just want to say, I don't know, it, may, it might be well known to this audience, but I just want to say a few words. So if K is a, is a semi-simple Lie group with bi-invariant metric G, I can let H be this uh, Carton three form, which is defined on left invariant vector fields using the Lie bracket like this. And then it's just a computation to show that these, uh, these two, but both, both bismuth connections actually are flat. Okay. This, this duality in the subject is a, uh, always a, somewhat of a mystery, but yeah, some, somehow both connections are always relevant. In any case, they're both flat. And there's this very old result of Carton Scouten, which is more general than this, but in particular implies that bismuth flat structures like this uh, have to be quotients of some simple weak. Okay, so this is basically the only example, the only compact example of, of bismuth flat manifold. And again, and the, the sort of most, the most basic example, which is relevant at various points in today and tomorrow is, um, is just the example of SU2. So SU2 is really S3. The metric is just the round metric and, and H is, is some multiple of the volume form. Right? Volume form. And what's I think important about this example, and again, this, this will come up in a few places, is that uh, somehow the, the, the geometric character of, of, of this as a generalized metric is, is completely different than without uh, the H, right? So, so if H is zero, this is like a positive constant Einstein, right? It's, uh, it's, it's positively curved, but in the generalized sense with the H turned on, it's flat, right? So it's somehow of a completely different nature once the, once the H field is, is turned on. Okay. All right, so, so I wanna uh, mention some more recent examples that were discovered. Um, so again, sort of approaching this theory of maybe generalized Einstein metrics, generalized Ricci solitons from sort of the beginning, the very beginnings, I mean, we can look at the beginnings of the stories of the Einstein manifolds. And there's this very old result by Alexievsky and Kimmelfeld from 1975, so a homogeneous Ricci flat manifold is flat. Uh, this is a, a nice result and, and its proof has a, a lot to say actually about sort of the geometry of, of Einstein metrics. So the, the modern proof of this uses this cheater gromal splitting to, to write the homogeneous manifold as a product of a, of a flat factor and a compact factor. And then you use the Bachner formula and the compact factor to show that um, um, all the left invariant vector fields are parallel show it's, it's flat. And so when Mario and I wrote the book, we just sort of naively asked, you know, is, is this true or is something like this true uh, in generalized, in the generalized case? And uh, it's not. So there's the recent work of Podesta Raffero. So they show the sort of analogous statement one might want to prove or generalized Ricci flat metrics. So I didn't really define this, but this is just soliton with no f. f is constant. Uh, it's false. So they produced infinitely many a homogeneous generalized Ricci flat structures on S3 cross S2, uh, none of which is bismuth flat. Okay. So, so this, is uh, this is false in the generalized world. And then sort of following that a uh, little bit later, they, they produced, uh, I, I guess the point is sort of infinite families like in all dimensions. They, they produced examples basically in every dimension, uh, similar to this. And there's actually some really interesting, I, I haven't fully absorbed it, but some really interesting geometry behind it. There's some sort of generalization of symmetric spaces with some order four involution. And I guess also they're realized as minimal submanifolds of bismuth flat spaces. So yeah, again, I, I think it's a very interesting piece of work, but I don't fully understand it yet. But yeah, so the point is there are now uh, 
these big classes of examples. And so since the original question, uh, yeah, by the way, I'll be mentioning a lot of sort of open problems and, and questions, um, some of which are probably just my own ignorance, uh, some of which are probably extremely hard, and maybe some of which are actually good questions. <laughs> so, but now, now that we know that there are these things, so maybe is it possible to classify in some sense? Uh, I don't know, maybe that's still a, a good question. And again, yeah, this is sort of forward looking to tomorrow. Are there examples that are compatible with the complex structure? So my understanding based on uh, chatting with them is that uh, none of these are. So, so maybe some version of, of this is true in the complex world. I, I don't know. Are the families discrete or are they continuous families? I, I think there are continuous families, um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. It's very new. Okay, so that's the first term that's not fitting to the second term. I mean, yeah, I I, I didn't need to state it twice. Okay. I just I, they wrote two papers. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just I, I think they, they they wrote this to sort of say, well, okay, the conjecture is false, and then they better understood their own construction and produced way more examples. I think that's what happened. So yeah, and the other thing I, I want to point out, so, so we, at least we have these examples of generalized Ricci flat. There are also genuinely uh, uh, compact examples of um, generalized Ricci solitons. So there's this basic point in like Ricci flow theory that compact, steady Ricci solitons are just Einstein. They're just Ricci flat, but that's not true in the generalized world. So I want to say a little bit about uh, this, this, um, this family of examples uh, that we found. So, so this Bismuth flat S3 that I described fits into a one parameter family of, of generalized Ricci solitons. I'll just say a bit about this construction. So it comes by viewing the S3 structure in kind of a special way. So S3 is of course the hot vibration over S2. And when you sort of uh, think in terms of the kaluza klein uh, reduction, the, the, the generalized Einstein equation becomes this kind of like Ricci Yang Mills. So here I only wrote the, I guess the sort of Einstein part uh, and, and, it, and it becomes just an equation on the scalar curvature because I'm two-dimensional. So, so, so F is the Yang-Mills field strength of the, of the Hopf connection. So, so the, basically the PDE on the, in terms of the metric is R minus norm F squared equals zero. Um, but you can sort of deform uh, this picture in a certain way. So, so you first of all sort of deform the Hopf connection into some Sasakian structure. And the simplest examples of these are um, some vibrations that have some um, stabilizers. So, so you, can, you can think of S3 as, as a circle fiber over like one of these like football orbifolds where, where here this is uh, modeled, uh, this is some like ZK orbifold, ZL orbifold point. So, so S2 has these kind of football orbifold uh, structures as they're called like American football. Um, and uh, you can think of S3 as a vibration over these things. And, and you can try to sort of solve, uh, you, you can again dimension reduce the, the Ricci soliton, the generalized Ricci soliton equation sort of on this, on this orbifold. And it turns out uh, this, is what it, this is what it looks like. So here, the point is the total space metric is, is Sasakian. And, and the T denotes like transverse. This is like the transverse structure to the Sasakian structure. And so you get this same kind of Ricci Yang Mills term like, like we saw here, but now maybe you have this gauge term. Involving the, the two things do not decouple. So it really is really a solution of this, which is not that the first summon holds equals to zero. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I guess I again I forgot to write the Yang Mills part, but now there's a sort of weighted Yang Mills condition for the for the bundle curvature. Um, and then a sort of observation coming sort of from this theory of Kalerichi solitons is you can show that um, that that J that the J grad F. Uh, is, is a killing field. And so basically the whole thing reduces to like an ODE. So, so it's invariant uh, like along these circles. Um, and, and so the whole thing just becomes an ODE on an, on an interval and, and you can solve that ODE and, and, and classify, okay? So, um, and, they, and they're, genuinely, they're genuinely solitons, like this F is, is not constant, okay? So there really are, and, and, and basically, yeah, by sort of, Letting letting the Sasaki structure go back to the hop vibration, it's it's the whole construction is smooth. So even though this is an orbifold, the total space metric is smooth. So yeah, so these things really exist, and I'll say more about these tomorrow. So this description that I'm giving is not really 
Well, it's sort of how I found it, but the point is we were actually working on like the hop surface in the setting of complex geometry. How many parameters that. you have to perform these? So, well, yeah, the first way I did it, uh, I had to solve, I have like, yeah, I have like three parameters, like, like the metric is sort of one function, the, the Yang-Mills curvature is a function, and then F as well. But it's kind of, the first proof was not the right one, <laughs> better proof. No. Like this paper, I, this first paper I wrote with Yuri, we give a better construction of these, where it's really just one function. You really use the complex geometry, and it's just one function of one variable, and you solve it, and everything comes out of that. So you have a cohomogeneity one uh, symmetry yeah. uh, group here. So yeah, SO3, I think, or, or it is a T2. T2. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, yeah, you have this like circle fiber on top of this picture, which I didn't draw. And then on top of that, this, this extra invariance on the football. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, like a, a really nice conjecture, uh, which I think is a great problem, but I, I don't really have a, an idea of how to do it. It's just that probably these are the only solitons. Um, I don't really have a, a great reason to believe that, except some of what I'll say tomorrow, maybe we'll explain why I think it's true, but... Uh, um, but, but under the T2 action, you can probably uh, prove this. That's, uh, yeah, the T2 that's sort of implicit in the construction, because yeah. in yeah. the end, we just have to like, sort of classify. Yeah. So yeah, with, assuming the invariant, it's true. And that's, of course, maybe one idea for how to prove it is to try to show they have to have an, like a, I mean, next it has to be only one or dimensional symmetry. Then, I mean, you put so the intermediate problem, slightly first that you have only one dimensional group of symmetries and then try to prove this in that case. Before well, you go to the general, but somehow the, this this second symmetry is kind of a priori, like it, it's really there. Well, but then so, no, yeah, but so then maybe that's what you're saying. Yeah, you show there's the one, and yeah. then the second one comes, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think this could be right. If you take your three dimensional manifold, cross it with with a circle, and go some combine yeah, it yeah. with a with complex structure, then is this true or? Yeah, so so that I'll I'll discuss uh, tomorrow. Yeah, so so we we do well. Sorry, it's it's not quite what you said. Yeah, so we do classify generalized Kähler Ricci solitons on four manifolds, and that's the other way to possibly prove this is to sort of show that exactly what you said. Like if I if I take a three dimensional generalized Ricci soliton, take a product with a circle, then that thing is generalized Kähler, but man, it's really hard to prove. But again, that sort of should be true and, and would follow if you knew these were the only examples, because that is true for these examples. They are coming from generalized Kähler structure. Okay, so finally, yeah, finally I can come to, to actually generalize Ricci flow. So yeah, so we kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, approach this idea of sort of canonical metrics and generalized geometry and define this this energy well, what should we mean by canonical metric but now we want to actually try to find them using using some pde method okay so we try to find them using this generalized Ricci flow which i've written here using the generalized metric so 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 g inverse ddt g is minus twice the generalized Ricci tensor this is an this is good enough to to define the equation but of course you you rapidly sort of unwind uh what the, the, all this stuff from earlier, what is the generalized Ricci tensor? What's a generalized metric? You unwind all these linear algebraic identities and you can see that it's equivalent to a one parameter family of pairs, a GTBT satisfying uh, this system of equations. So, so the metric is evolving by sort of Ricci flow minus twice Ricci and then plus this one half H squared. And then DBDT is minus D star H where H is always some background uh, plus DB. And of course you'll notice that the dilaton has kind of magically disappeared here. Um, uh, well, yeah, and again, it's sort of part of the mystery of Ricci flow, of course, and sometimes I could add it, uh, but the point is that the, the way it appears in the flow equations is always as tangent to a one parameter family of diffeomorphism, so you can always remove it. And, but this point of view is, is essential to sort of the analysis of Ricci flow, where you can kind of treat it as some arbitrary parameter, you can kind of solve for which dilaton you want to sort of include with your flow. So are these directly the equations or? Have yeah. you done some in the dark transformation? No, oh, well, uh, okay. Uh, it may be in the strictest sense, based on what I said, I have gauge modified to, to throw it off. Yeah. Or you, you're using just the remaining debris. Or, or, yeah, I, right. So I guess yeah, when I discussed the generalized Ricci, I kind of allowed myself <laughs> this freedom of picking an F, and I can just say, well, I'm just going to pick F as constant. Yeah. Maybe just to be more precise. So if you have a solution to this without F, 
can you put in an F? Can you put in an F and get a solution? By gauge general modifying. equations? Yeah. 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 If you if you if you pull your solution back by diffeomorphisms, yeah. Yeah, you, you could really have an arbitrary one prime. Like it would be like plus a hesh and f and then an interior product of the gradient of f at h term in here. And you could put any family of f you want. And, and this is just yeah, and more, more generally with, with a vector field, you can modify this. Yeah, even a vector field, right? It doesn't have to be gradient. It would be like the last part of the vector. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, but sort of somehow like intelligently choosing some family of f's as part of the game to actually you know, prove something. So yeah, and then I suppose maybe, maybe I don't really need to say too much about this. This is kind of how I originally thought of it. It's sort of Ricci flow connections with torsion, of course. So again, I guess I sort of said this. So, so Nabla is D plus G inverse H. Here's this uh, uh, bismuth Ricci tensor again. And you can just kind of think of it, this is just sort of somehow in between the, this classical point of view and the generalized point of view. It's just the time derivative of G minus B is the, is the bismuth Ricci tensor minus twice the bismuth. Okay, so yeah, um, I want to uh, uh, sort of go through some of the the fundamental points of a Ricci flow theory and tell you like what we know and what we don't know uh, about about generalized Ricci flow and the rest of the talk. So as far as the sort of basic analysis, I'm going to go through this very quickly. So so the you have kind of all the same fundamental regularity properties that you have for Ricci flow. One is like short time existence on compact manifolds with smooth smooth, smooth initial data. So that of course is proved like by this the Turk trick where the, this is a standard kind of method where of course this this generalized Ricci flow in the end it, it's not parabolic it's degenerate parabolic where the the degeneracy is coming from a, a gauge action which in this case is the group of generalized diffeomorphisms it's maybe not so surprising so like diffeomorphism semi-direct product with a B field action um, so you sort of use the diffeomorphisms to gauge fix the metric and the B field action to gauge fix the the B flow. So of course, I mean, if you just think naively, uh, like the symbol of this PDE for B is just gonna be minus like D star DB. It's like half of a Laplacian, right? So you need the B field action to, to get the other half. So this is how it works. Um, or the symmetry group, I mean, to, to produce the other half. So Jeff, are you about the other equations? If you add in a function, you know, S of F, whatever, then F should evolve in some way. Well, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, so like I see, yeah, just keep right now. So it's like DG minus plus H. Plus F and then DB DT is minus D star H uh, plus I grad F H. Um, this, well, and I, maybe I just decorate it with a T. I mean, it can, it can be completely arbitrary. And you just pull, I mean, you, you pull your solution to this back by the diffeomorphisms generated by grad FT, and you produce this, you produce the solution to this. But yeah, but so like in all these like prominent monotonicity formulas, et cetera, like you want to be much more careful about yeah. what, what your F is. Yeah. But the point is, it's like, it's a freedom. It's, sure. it's like, it's weird. I think from the generalized point of view, we think of the divergence operator as a little bit more sacred, whereas sort of from the classical or like Ricci flow point of view, it's it's just a way of interacting with the diffeomorphism group or something, or it's it's just this kind of free parameter to to help you prove an estimate, basically. <laughs> um, yeah, but actually, I'll, I'll show something in a minute which gives yet another point of view or or, or a different point of view of what the dilaton really is. Um, um, but yeah, okay, so, so you do have short time existence. Um, of course, the cohomology class is preserved. So, so it sort of really is like a flow on a fixed current algebraid. Um, uh, a standard thing you wanna know is, is how, uh, like what causes a singularity of the flow? What do I have to prove to be able to be sure I, I can extend my flow and sort of a bound on, and I really need Riemann here, like a bound on the classic Riemann is enough to show the flow is smooth. Um, of course, more or less by definition, oh, well, I, I didn't, I guess, say it exactly, but you can just put together what I wrote as the PDE on the previous slide about lambda to show that it's the gradient flow for lambda. And again, this is a generalization of Perelman's first observation where he proved Ricci flow as a gradient flow for this lambda with no H. And it's fixed, the, the lambda is fixed if and only if it's a generalized Ricci soliton. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, these are just some basic points. Some, some kind of fundamental analysis, which is uh, not known and possibly interest, interesting. I mean, so you can ask, is the generalized Ricci flow well posed on a complete manifold? So on complete manifolds, you definitely have to add some kind of hypothesis. And in Ricci flow, the first results in this direction assume a like bounded Riemann. Almost certainly this is true. I don't have any great application in mind, but probably that's true. It requires a lot of PDE work. Um, and uh, presumably some weaker bounds other than Riemann being bounded will guarantee smooth existence. So for instance, I probably like just bounded Bismuth Ricci should be enough because this sort of will show you the metric is staying controlled in a C0 sense. And that's uh, basically enough by these arguments of Sesson for Ricci flow. Um, but okay, um, yeah. I, to get back to sort of more geometric things, um, yeah, I want to talk about a sort of a new result which has not appeared yet. So, um, so, so Ricci flow started with this uh, paper of, of Hamilton on three manifolds with positive Ricci curvature, and one of the sort of dominant themes in Ricci flow is this preservation of positive curvature conditions. There's any number of papers in this direction, and the most fundamental of these is this preservation of, of a lower bound on scalar curvature. So this is sort of the first computation that usually gets done, maybe after proving short time existence for Ricci flow is to prove uh, this formula. So, so if you have a solution, just a classic Ricci flow, so the H is gone, you take the time derivative of scalar curvature, you get the Laplacian plus twice the magnitude of Ricci squared. And the point of course, is just that, that this is a positive, non-negative time, okay? So you apply a parabolic maximum principle, you prove a lower bound on the scalar curvature is, is preserved, okay? And then of course, th there's any number of much more involved uh, results in this direction, this positive curvature operator, positive isotropic curvature, quarter pinch sectional curvature. So all these famous works on Ricci flow uh, where they show that these are all preserved. And here you have to apply this tensor maximum principle. So it's more complicated than just the scalar maximum principle for this equation, okay? So, um, so yeah, so I was recently able to find a, an extension of this scalar curvature result to generalize Ricci flow using this key new ingredient, which I, I will call the dilaton flow. Okay, so, so here, here's this scalar PDE I wanna write down. And I deliberately use the function phi instead of f, which I, I don't know, uh, in the Ricci flow world, f is always sort of Perelman's f, which has a particular evolution equation. This is not that evolution equation. So, so phi here is satisfying a forward heat equation, plus again, this all this numerology in this subject, this magic number one six. So one six norm h squared. Now, this, as I understand it, is the well, uh, is the flow of the dilaton coming from this renormalization group flow picture, which I can't uh, pretend <laughs> to understand. But, um, uh, but I guess I don't know. It, Actually, it's not so clear. I've seen other physics works where they give a different flow for the dilaton in the RG flow picture. But in some works, this is this is the dilaton flow in coming from RG flow. Um, and so in, in this work of uh, Garcia Fanet, as, as I discussed earlier, so to define the Ricci tensor, you, you do need this divergence operator. And at least in some restricted class, the variations of these are identified with exact one forms. So again, if we're thinking in the generalized world, it should make sense that this should be dynamic, right? I mean, if somehow this is part of what it takes to define Ricci, I mean, of course, yeah, we can in an ad hoc way say, well, we always mean the Ramani divergence, but maybe not. Maybe we mean something a little bit different. Um, and so, so maybe it's natural that, that this should, that, that there should be some, uh, some scalar flow like attached uh, to the PD uh, item too. I guess I already said that. Um, yeah, so yeah, this is coming from the RG flow picture in string theory. Also, you can derive this, this PDE from some special cases of this generalized Kähler Ricci flow that I'll talk about tomorrow. This is, of course, how I really found it or convinced myself it, it meant something. Um, it's coming from this generalized Kähler Ricci flow. Anyways, I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, but yeah, actually, one question I'm interested in is there sort of a purely mathematical derivation of this that isn't using RG flow, maybe coming from this F functional in a different way? Because this, I, Anyways, it's maybe not, it's a sort of a vague question, but I, I don't really know. Uh, I know it's right and meaningful, but I don't really know a mathematical derivation of sort of um, how you squeeze this PDE out exactly. And another sort of general question is maybe, so, so again, I'm, I'm interpreting this, this scalar flow as kind of a flow of divergence operators, but maybe there's a more general flow of divergence operators that should be coupled to generalized Ricci flow. 
again, I don't know. And again, maybe answering this thing in two is some way to, to see what that might be. Um, and yeah, like maybe you can derive a more general flow of divergence operators. Okay, but what is it we actually do uh, with this? So now I'm thinking of generalized Ricci flow as, as three things. And, uh, and so it's the metric, H and, and phi. And so even though phi is satisfying this PDE, it's not uh, like showing up in, in the flow this way. It's still uncoupled. It's still just the, the, the Ricci flow. Well, it's uncoupled in, in one direction. Like uh, phi is not appearing in these equations, but of course H is appearing in phi equation. So it's uncoupled in that direction. But so anyways, I do have a generalized scalar curvature. So I have these three objects flowing, as I said, they do have a, a generalized scalar curvature like this, like we discussed. And the sort of magical fact is that uh, you get an exact analog of this, of this scalar curvature monotonicity. So you take the time derivative of, of this generalized scalar curvature, you get the Laplacian of, of the generalized scalar, scalar curvature plus twice the H phi Ricci tensor squared, norm squared. So the Laplacian is just the usual one, the district of G. Yeah, this, this again is a sort of mysterious part of this subject. This is just the Romanian Laplacian. Of course, for scalars, they're the same, right? So, so this is also the bismuth Laplacian, if you like. But maybe that's cheating. Um, but yeah, but is, they're the same. So, so for any other tensor bundle, they're not the same. But for scalars, they're the same. It's the same Laplacian. Um, so yeah, so in particular, like a lower bound on this scalar curvature is, is preserved. That's, that's automatic. By, by the maximum principle. And there's also, so I guess I, I don't state it in the slides, but there's a rigidity result that, that follows as well. So basically like if you have a structure with non-negative generalized scalar curvature, then it will either admit, you can either flow it to one with strictly positive uh, generalized scalar curvature or it's a soliton. That's sort of the strong maximum principle applied to, to this equation. Either you can nudge it to be positive everywhere or, or this term had to just be zero everywhere. If H is zero, does this give new results in the of dinner of uh, Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, it, yeah, I, actually I did some very uh, last minute digging around and maybe actually somewhere buried in the literature, there might be something like this. Um, but I think this interpretation as, as sort of like a flow of generalized scalar curvature and sort of, and the heat flow, not as the heat flow, but as this dilaton flow. So somehow uh, that is definitely missing from, from the literature, I think. Um, this kind of geometric point of view on it. But I think strictly speaking, the formula might appear somewhere. I mean, in the years following Perlman, like it was just an absolute like hurricane of papers. <laughs> so Sorry, it might you, be in there. Could you repeat what you said? So are you saying that you can, that, that when you proceed in the flow, you will get everywhere positive generalized scalar curvature? No, no, yeah. only if I start, but so yeah. So so the, 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 the statement is that if I have R H V bigger or equal to zero, um, then, then you have this dichotomy, uh, either there exists, can you see, or, uh, sure. It's fine, it's fine. Uh, either there exists. There is another blackboard behind um, that one, so you can, yes. Oh, okay, yeah. So, so if you start with uh, RH degree equal to zero, then either there exists um, H prime, G prime, G prime, such that R, H prime, E prime is strictly positive, uh, or um, H, H, e is zero, or it's a solid. And that's, yeah, again, that's like strong maximum principle. And prime means for some like Yeah, th this would be like the time epsilon flow. Yep. Yeah, exactly. But then, yeah, I mean, like for all times of the flow forward, it would be at least non-negative and strictly positive if it's not part of the solid zone. But, uh, but, but, but somehow you're saying that immediately it becomes positive in, in the first Yeah, phase. it's instantaneous. Okay. That's instantaneous. Yeah. So, so you were mentioning that some, in some physics literature, the, the, this local flow looks different? Well, I think I've seen some papers where instead of this Laplacian plus one six norm h squared, it's like you flow by the generalized scalar curvature. Right, right. right. So, so yeah. do you know if 
you know if a similar result all if you make that take that as a, as a form or you might try it. I yeah I think I think maybe Mario tried and yeah I think it's yes. messy, where it's pretty messy. <laughs> it doesn't, yeah it's, it's kind of it's kind of a mess. And and, uh, and in, in like uh, how how do you <clears throat> what is the proof of this theorem? Uh, uh, is it calculation. Just, but is it is it direct <laughs> or is it something? I mean I yeah, it's, it's just a calculation. I don't know. I, I don't know how to say it. I don't want to say it's hard or easy. It's okay. just it's a calculation. I, I mean, know. you have to go <laughs> very, very far away in the math, in the physics literature to get this this formula for the dynamical particles. In in the in the later I think in yeah, but in the later papers, people write it in a in a different. Oh, I see. In a, they yeah. start like messing up with the beta functions and they write it in a different way. But in, okay. in the original, in the original. Papers is pretty nice. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And right. I mean, for me, I don't go much farther than Polchinski a lot of time. And yeah, it's, uh, that's what it is in this book. Yeah. Um, but yeah, again, I would I would love to know a sort of non-physics derivation of that flow. Do you think that there's a, a characteristic class obstruction to existence of positive generalized Ricci uh, a scalar? Yeah, right. So there's some kind of like a roof genus thing going on with this. Yeah. For for like for the for the one third connection or something like that. Can you that. see that thing? I mean, right. So there's positive scalar curvature obstructions related to this like A roof genes, like Lichnerovich, like direct oh. that whole story. There's some kind of thing like that going on here, um, where where or some kind of results. Uh, yeah, I mean, only at this like borderline case though, where you have like non-negative. I mean, that that's really where you're getting something strong is in this borderline case where you're non-positive to, not sorry, not non-negative to positive. <laughs> But yeah, I'm not sure uh, if that's been studied in the literature. But, uh, but I think, yeah, there's something interesting there, I think. Yeah. And then, yeah, just again, sort of like a naive question. This is something, of course, I thought about like, years ago. Like, so maybe positivity of this like Bismuth curvature operator is preserved by generalized Ricci flow. But again, this result makes you wonder. Somehow you have to incorporate maybe the stiloton into what you mean by Bismuth curvature tensor in the first place. I, I don't really know like a weighted version of that of the of the whole tensor. We know what the weighted Ricci tensor is, the weighted scalar, but I don't know like a weighted version of the whole curvature tensor. It's just somehow you have to incorporate this. Oh, by the way, do I go to eleven? Or... Yeah, you probably have like okay, yeah. that's a few more. Um yeah, so <clears throat> um yeah, another sort of very basic fact in the Ricci flow story is that Ricci flow preserves holonomy. And here we know almost nothing. I think it's an interesting thing to, to look into. So, so there's kind of two, two proofs of this uh, that both, I guess, are due to Hamilton. So, so you can study the evolution of the curvature tensor. And it's actually a, a sort of a very delicate point that, that the sort of reaction ODE that shows up. So it's a reaction diffusion type equation. And the reaction ODE sort of preserves the holonomy subalgebra. It's a fairly delicate point, and you also have to use this so-called Uhlenbeck trick. You have to kind of modify the, the equation a little bit by picking a nice frame. Um, but you can also kind of cheat a little bit, and you can use the Berger classification. And then all you really need to know is that Ricci flow separately preserves Einstein metrics, that's trivial, uh, products, and then the Kähler condition. And once you know this, it sort of follows, okay, well, it preserves holonomy. Or at the very least, it shows that the holonomy doesn't expand and then you need a little bit more PDE work to show it doesn't contract either. That's due to Kachvar. So it truly preserves it. Okay. So yeah, it's a it's a nice feature of a Ricci flow, but I think it doesn't get too much attention because we just say, well, okay, a Kähler is preserved, and then Kähler Ricci flow is kind of its own thing after that. Um, but yeah, so a, a question I have basically no answer to at all. Well, almost no answer is yeah, to what extent this this extends to generalized Ricci flow. Part of the problem is that well, we have no real generalized, as far as I understand it, no real meaningful notion of holonomy and generalized geometry in the first place. And even if what you mean is just the holonomy of the Bismuth connection, which probably that's meaningful, even that the story of holonomy of connections with torsion is uh, way more complicated than for the levy chivita connection. Um, but so anyways, I think it's an interesting point. And yeah, so in the next lecture, I'll, pr I'll discuss how Ricci, generalized Ricci flow preserves this pluriclosed condition and also generalized Kähler. And at least pluri closed, this is of course a holonomy reduction condition. So this is saying that the Bismuth connection preserves a complex structure. And so we have some evidence that there is a holonomy preserving thing going on with generalized Ricci flow. And I wonder about generalized Kähler. Like, can you think of that this way as well as being a holonomy reduction? But I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let's see. Yeah, I have a few minutes, I guess. Um, 
Yeah, so maybe I quickly discuss uh, going in a, in a, again, in a different direction, uh, this second variation property. So again, another sort of standard theme in, in Ricci flows is this idea of sort of stability around fixed points. And this is, uh, this is work done by my student, uh, Kwon Kui, who, who discussed this work in the poster session yesterday. So maybe I go a little bit quickly. Um, so you can compute, and so, you, so re, generalized Ricci flow is a gradient flow of this lambda. So you can compute a second variation to, to think about stability. That's given by some self-adjoint operator against this weighted volume form, which I won't write out, only I'll just tell you the symbol is, so acting on the variation of the metric is Laplacian plus div star div. This is the divergence, Ramanian divergence. And then the, the linearized operator acting on the B field part is just D star D, that's easy to see. Um, and so, of course, it's not quite uh, elliptic. They never are, right? Again, there's, there's this infinite dimensional kernel coming from the symmetry group. Um, uh, nonetheless, so, so he was able to prove that this bismuth flat structure on S3 is, is weakly uh, linear, linearly stable. And of course, it has to be weakly so. Yeah, there has to be a non-trivial kernel even beyond the, the symmetry group because of this existence of solitons. Right? So we know we have this moduli space of solitons. And so the tangent directions to that moduli space are in the kernel. And actually, there's a really nice geometric interpretation of what they are coming from eigenvalues of the Laplacian on S3. It's a, it's a very sort of delicate, sharp calculation, actually. But um, more recently, he was able to prove that, in fact, all these bismuth flat manifolds are, are linearly stable. And yeah, you have to work a bit harder with this operator. It, this operator is a, sort of a, a bit of a nightmare. Weekly, um, weekly linear. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, weekly. weekly. Yeah, weekly. Um, there, no compatibility with complex structure. And yeah, the name this and is all a close. Yeah, there's no complex right. structure. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so it's then the sort of companion result you want to know once you know what some stable guys are is are, are they actually sort of dynamically stable? So if you fix, so this is a general PDE theorem here. So if you if you if you have a steady generalized Ricci solid, this is generalized Ricci solid time domain, this by steady. Uh, and you assume it's linearly stable, then he proves it's dynamically stable. So again, this is a sort of standard type of result in the field. So what it means is for a sufficiently small perturbation, uh, you will exist globally and converge to some soliton. Of course, not necessarily the one you started with, right? Because you can move in the moduli space. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and right, so maybe I, yeah, so the proof is a fairly a standard thing. So yeah, I only have a few minutes. So uh, yeah, of course, there's this standard issue where again, this gauge group rears its head. So you have this group of, this infinite dimensional group of diffeomorphisms, but there's this nice, fairly recent work of Rubio Tipler. So they show this sort of version of Shiger Evan slice theorem in generalized geometry. So they prove you can always construct a slice to the orbit of the generalized diffeomorphism action on metrics. And that's the key point. So once you, once you have this slice theorem, it's a, yeah, again, this is a fairly standard circle of ideas sort of in, in this kind of flow literature. It's, there's this very general result that Kolding Minikozy proved. Once you have this slice theorem, uh, you can prove this so-called Loyusevich inequality. So, so this is some quantitative estimate of the difference of your given structure the difference of the lambda of your given structure from the sort of known critical value of lambda raised to some power, beta is between zero and one half uh, in terms of the gradient, okay? So the, the, these are proved, um, Louis Savage originally proved these or, or used these inequalities in the context of proving convergence of gradient flows for like real analytic functions. In any case, the, the, the point is this gives you sort of like a quantitative rate of decay of lambda towards the, towards the critical value. And, and in any case, it's some parabolic regularity bootstrapping on top of this, uh, but it's a, it's a fairly standard. There's nothing really new, I guess, happening here. The, the key point is, is this lois savage inequality. And the key point there is this, is this slice through. So I could, could miss something. Uh, is all the solitons in constructed stable? Right, so I don't know that. Oh. Yeah, and, and we didn't really compute it. I, I guess, um, uh, I guess it follows for ones that are sufficiently close yeah. to the round one. I guess right. it follows. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but they all should be. Yeah, so maybe that's again, I, I, sorry, yeah, the, these generalized solitons that I discussed on S3, he asked, are they stable? And again, almost certainly yes, but and for, for ones that are close enough to the round structure, provably yes, oh. but, uh, but no, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you have them fairly explicitly in hand, so like maybe it could be computed, but, um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, okay, so I guess I, yeah, may I just have a couple minutes, I don't know. Um, yeah, oh, okay, I'll just maybe quickly say something about, there's one sort of very, so, so going beyond these kind of 
structural analytic results. You want to actually prove some global existence results. You want to prove that you know the flow really does something. So maybe I just discuss sort of one case in detail. So uh, the most interesting case. So generalized Ricci flow is just Ricci flow on Riemann, Riemann surfaces. So the first time you get something because H just would be zero, right? So the first time you get something new is on a three manifold, but you can still sort of do a flow on Riemann surfaces by dimension reduction. So if you impose an S1 symmetry, you think of your three manifold as a principal bundle over a Riemann surface, you get a dimension reduced flow. And maybe I just kind of spare us the details a bit. Um, the, the metric, so, so you impose this kaluza klein type onsatz. You also impose this special onsatz for H. So H is like the bundle curvature wedge the connection. This is this onsatz shows up a lot, like in Holstrominger and stuff like this. Um, and then this generalized Ricci flow uh, now is is what I call the Ricci Yang Mills flow. I study this in my thesis. It's Ricci flow coupled to Yang Mills. So it naturally is sort of a subclass of generalized Ricci flow, which I think is interesting. But so, anyways, it's a slightly different PDE. F is a two form now, but structurally it's very similar. Okay. Um, but now that's happening on a Riemann surface. And so basically the point of this theorem is we we describe um, completely basically what, what happens with, with this dimension reduced generalized Ricci flow on, well, on surfaces, I guess. And what's the most interesting case, so maybe, maybe we can talk about it later, but the most interesting case uh, that, that I, I, I think makes, makes this whole story interesting is um, the case of positive, so, so there's different behavior depending on the topology, depending on the topology of the base and the topology of the bundle. But actually, you see that the bundle doesn't really play much role uh, when the Euler characteristic is negative or, or zero. I don't put some hypothesis here. But in the case of the sphere, the behavior is completely different depending on whether the bundle is trivial or not. So again, I just saw summarize in words. So if the bundle is trivial, what you see is what happens in standard Ricci flow. So it's not Ricci flow. There is this F term or H term. It's, it is there. So it's there in the PDE. But basically, what you see is what happens in Ricci flow. It converges to a round point. So Ricci flow on S2 uh, shrinks in finite time and it gets rounder as it does so. And so this other one does that if the bundle is trivial. But if the bundle is not trivial, then you get global existence and convergence to a quotient of this bismuth flat S3. So this I, I like because it's showing the influence of, of, of the H term in a real concrete way. So Isn't basically the, the triviality or not of the bundle is precisely the triviality or not of H in cohomology on a total space. And this doesn't require rescaling along the floor. No, yeah, no, that's the whole point. Yeah, it's that, yeah, this just like straight up on the nose converges to, to this thing without rescaling, yeah. So again, like the, 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 the topological hypothesis of, of H being, you know, switched on, so to speak, um, gives you this completely different behavior of, of what happens on this. Um, and so lot of don't appear because um, uh, yeah, um, uh, basically because they, they live, uh, yeah, so, so there's a more general result to be proved where it's not quite a principal bundle, right? Um, where, where the base is an orbifold, and that's where the solitons will appear, right? Because not a equation, it's not yeah. S2 smoothest. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. But but in this theorem, it, it is. Yeah, because I, I really have a principal bundle. Like that's really yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a circle bundle, not just there's an S one action on. And yeah. There's like a yeah. In the more general case, it would be like a non-free. Yeah. S S one action. And, then and it's a, so. Yeah. Exactly. Can you mean it's a position by a finite group of S three with a bismuth flat structure? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, the um, depending on the churn class, it's not actually the total space isn't actually S three, right? It's, 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then I think a really nice conjecture, but yeah, this is not one. Uh, I, I think it's almost certainly true, but will not be proved that in my lifetime. Said <laughs> before, for any uh, metric on S three, if you have an H which is turned on in cohomology, I think sort of without the symmetry hypothesis, it should converge to a soliton. I think I feel pretty sure that's true uh, for for some reasons involving what. Uh, Roughly speaking, you know, if you expect kind of like neck pinch type singularities, basically with H turned on, they, they kind of can't show up. So you would sort of expect it to always converge to these. Okay, so I'm probably already over, but I just want to mention a few other kind of general facts. Um, one is Ricci flow preserves T duality. I or generalized Ricci flow preserves T duality. I didn't really say anything about that. Does it preserve any of these other dualities coming from physics? I have no idea. Uh, another thing I'm just curious to throw at this group is I have no idea really what the correct analog of comparison geometry is in generalized geometry. So is there a correct notion of volume which sort of incorporates B or H, which sort of is 
linked to the Bismuth Rishi in the same way that volume is linked to classic Rishi. Of course, there is this Borninfeld volume, which I guess is first written down by Marco, which is presumably the right guess, but I still don't really know a nice way to relate it to, to the Bismuth Rishi tensor. This would probably be useful. Um, and then another thing I think is, is interesting and very much doable is just there should be other, like once you have a good theory of, of generalized Ricci tensor for other algebroids, you should get other flavors of generalized Ricci flow, which presumably are coupled to other kinds of interesting fields. And all of this work should presumably carry over in some fashion, like non-exact, this type E end, into, uh, so generalized G2, a uh, whole strometer, this all seems to be maybe uh, possible. Um, but yeah, okay, thank you. Please. Any questions for Jeff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Curiosity question. Yeah. If you multiply H by epsilon, let's say. Yeah. Uh, can you see this as a, a regularizing operation with respect to the original which he flow? Because you mentioned this thing that the similarities might not be able to obtain. Right. Um, well, I mean, yeah, I suppose if, if well, I mean, I wonder, like even even for this, like, like even for this result I, I talked about, like on S2 with the bundle, uh, like switched on or not, or like with H uh, switched on or not. Um, I mean, It may be like as you let epsilon go to zero. I don't know. May, maybe the singularity. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure what would happen on that. But I mean, in some sense, if, if you expect it to converge to this flow line, I'm not sure how that would happen. It's, it seems a bit. Yeah, I'm not sure. But maybe it'll be a little bit hard question. So as soon as H is in place, then you cannot collapse any three-dimensional volume which has no bouncing when you integrate the uh, over some three dimensional manifold h is is non yeah exactly you better collapse that but there's these kind of like yeah, but it's rough by it's always yeah allowed to. yeah i'm just trying to imagine like those flow lines converging to the one which just like disappears after a fixed number of seconds it's maybe not impossible but i'm not sure yeah what happens if your equations if h actually vanishes identically in in a a big open set like the, the evolution will make it non-zero automatically as well yeah it's sort of that kind of behavior is instantaneously ruined right. by 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 heat equations yeah uh, and just as a trivial remark of course if it starts identically zero it yeah. stays zero. Yeah, 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 yeah. but other than that this yeah the, the second equation there right dp dt is equal to the star of h plus yeah i mean i have this gauge term i grad f t h where f is some one parameter family of functions but like if, if H is identically zero in a neighborhood of, uh, of your point, then the, the right hand side is all zero, right? Yes, but uh, you cannot argue this way. <laughs> like, like just like like think of like like the scalar heat equation with a some kind of like paraboloid that comes down, even if it's zero in an open set, at right. every positive time, it will be strictly positive. This is a, yeah. It's called like a like infinite propagation scheme. Yeah. Yeah. Can you elaborate a bit on what the preservation of the duality means? Yeah, so, um, uh, or I guess we don't need the slide, there's not a great slide. So, so yeah, so, so, so T duality requires uh, some symmetry group. And then, uh, and then, well, at least from, from my point of view, or at least the, 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 the lowest tech point of view is basically this Busher rules, right? And so, so basically I can take an invariant flow line at every time I can apply the Busher rules. Again, I'm assuming like the topological T duality in the first place, right? So, so, so I have some, some space with invariant structure. I have its topological T dual. I can, I can take the flow line and at every time T I can T dualize, or I can take the initial data, T dualize that, and then solve the generalized Ricci flow on the dual. And then the point is they're the same. Yeah. So the T, so the T duality like preserves the flow line, if you like. And I guess one way to see yeah. that's but your original equation, because you go into G and B very quickly, but your original equation was in terms of the generalized metric, right? So it was just grand algebra data. Yeah, so I guess I forget, like in the book, maybe we give like both proofs or something. I mean, yeah, there's kind of like a more high-minded, truly generalized proof that's probably very short. Right. But we um 
Probably I insisted on playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess, the, I guess the point of the other one is that it, it, it becomes uh, like, it, it, since throughout this is isomorphism like and the matrix just transport it, just transport the equations, right? So it's like, it's not just push the rules, because that's about the matrix, I guess. But well, Bushman is that structure. both, right? I mean, it's or it's everything. It's G and H, right? Yeah, yeah but if you have more structure, because one of the questions was like, what about holonomy and so on, right? And then it might be more obvious from that point of view that certain things are preserved. So to the flow or it's the so, Well, yeah. I mean, of course, the T rally assumes some symmetry in the first place. So it's, but, but yeah. Fair enough, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can make a comment also that like this is true more generally in quantum theory too. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So Friedrich has this work. Will you talk about that? No. No. Okay. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. That that uh, that there's yeah more general. That's right. Yeah. There's this Poisson Lee. I, I asked it does it preserve these other dualities. So this is like more general Poisson Lee T duality, which yeah, which he proved um, is preserved. By the I yeah. have a question. So, is there some study of singularity models for the Ricci flow, like like for the classical uh, Ricci flow? I mean, uh, yeah. So, uh, three dimensions, say. Yeah. Right. So, so actually, yeah. If I'm really, uh, if I want to tell you what I really think, so 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 here, say the conjecture like on S three, if the H is turned on, you you converge to the round S three. It's probably true that on three manifolds, if the H is turned on, there's no singularities in finite time. And there's just some sort of vague reasoning which suggests that maybe this is true. Um, but yeah, like as far as like an actual structural uh, like uh, study of what happens even in three dimensions, no, we don't have that yet. Because even the most basic tools we were missing until recently. So, so this recent work of, of Richard Baumler, so he showed this sort of amazing generalization of common singularity work, showing that in general you have these co-dimension four singularities and pretty much all uses Scalar curvature bounds and and like extensive analysis of um, like these entropy formulas and very deep analysis using just these entropy monotonicities. We pretty much have these things now, more or less. I didn't talk at all about the Perlman side of the story, but there are like these Perlman type. I mean, underlying this this lambda monotonicity is a Perlman type monotonicity formula, and there's sort of like a shrinking entropy formula as well. And and now we have the scalar curvature lower bound. So you know, I think it's not crazy to think that. That something like this co-dimension four regularity, you know, is is achievable. Um, you know, it's it's a real tour de force. It's like three hundred some plus pages of analysis from like last year. But uh, but but really, it relies on this handful of key structural properties of of Ricci flow, um, and that now we seem to have good versions of it. So, some hope. Yes, one question. Is, so is this the main application of this uh, general scalar curvature monotonicity formulas? This is what you expected to get rid of, of uh, singularities? In well, not get rid of, uh, but, but understand. So, so somehow, somehow this, the lower bound of scalar curvature is a, is a really important part for various reasons. I mean, it, it sh part of the reason is because it shows up in this so-called conjugate heat operator. And so it helps you control that operator, which shows up in the analysis. And uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's you, you don't expect it to sort of remove singularities, but it's just it's just a sort of structural part of understanding uh, the, the structure of singularities. Yeah. So um, I'm just, just about like maybe, maybe an oddball question, which is you know you, you studied a lot the um, the Yang Mills Ricci flow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In that in that theory, is it useful? I mean, is it really significant to think of it as the curvature of a connection on a principal bundle? Or you, you, you mean really like just... like the Bismuth connection on the total space? Like, is that what you mean? I just mean, or... you know, when you're studying the Yang Mills flow, is it helpful or important to think to, to really think of it as being pre-quantized that you have oh, a connection oh, on a bundle? Oh. Yeah. Or can you just think um, of it as a field on the base? Uh, yeah, no, it's not it's not so essential to the analysis. Yeah. So in similarly fact, for generalized. Yeah, in flow. fact, yeah, the, the result I said, yeah, it does not actually even yeah, the result on the on this on the slide on the following slide describing the flow for for remote services. Um, yeah, you 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 could yeah you could replace this with just the flow for the two form, and the right. two form doesn't have to be inter integral or anything like okay, that. So it has no and impact. it would also hold. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so as far as the analysis is concerned, that's irrelevant. Yeah.
Okay. So there are no further questions. Let's thank Jeff again.